Let me uh, allow me to introduce uh, this evening's lecturer, Rinka Dubuldam. Rinka Dubuldam is a professor and chair of the Department of Architecture at the University of Pennsylvania, where she has been on the faculty since 1995. She is the founder and president of Architectonics, a research-based architecture and design practice in New York City. Dubuldam's practice, I quote, believes in creating original, innovative, and sustainable designs that are expressed in optimized, energy-efficient, and sustainable solutions. Built projects include residential and commercial buildings in New York, Philadelphia, and Rotterdam, as well as numerous interiors in the U.S. and abroad. Architectonics is also the lead architect for the reinvigoration of downtown Bogota, Colombia. The practice has been the subject of three monographs, with the Dubuldam Architect from 1996, at Index from 2006, and most recently Architectonics from 2010. Her work has been exhibited at MoMA, at Max Protech Gallery, and at PS1 in New York City at two uh, Venice Architecture Biennales and at the Tel Aviv Museum of Art and then among many others. She is the recipient of numerous honors, including the Architectural League of New York's Emerging Voices Award, Esquire Magazine Genius Issue Best and Brightest, and was this year named as one of 30 most admired educators in architecture by design intelligence, so that's the same publication that ranks our architecture program so highly every year. Having graduated from Columbia, an early hotbed for digital design with an advanced degree in architecture in 1992, and establishing architectonics soon thereafter, Wake Up was a part of, I would say, the first wave of young architects whose work sought to effectively connect the potential of the digital with the realities of contemporary practice. Over the past two decades, she and her firm have been role models for other emerging designers worldwide, having substantially influenced and inspired architecture, academia, and the profession alike. Please help me welcome Wayne Dubuldam. Uh, I have been, I was originally, uh, especially in the first 
first early years of the 90s of extremely interested in uh, in the Goza and uh, tried to tell everyone that it was really the only thing you needed to do was read the Goza and then there was automatically a great design that would use to pop up in my head at least, you know, in any other country. But um, we were very interested in the idea of smart skin uh, optimizing uh, what was essentially already in the uh, we're looking for tight fit, smart systems, and, uh, and kind of perfection. And of course, what, what was really interesting for us was that fragmentation, in many, many ways, is almost always an optimization. Uh, here in nature, uh, algae or small cell systems grow by splitting, fragmenting into multiple other systems. Uh, you all know this one. It's where our email messages get fragmented in order to go faster through the internet and reassemble just before they arrive and become a message again. And then, of course, fragmentation is a really big part of what the bottom-up system would be. And bottom-up systems I'll discuss a little bit further in um, some of the urban projects we've done. I thought today it would be interesting to kind of go from uh, large, from uh, um, from mega scales to mini scales, because I think what's really interesting, and I had this discussion with Juan uh, Nero uh, this morning, that especially in Europe, we don't we don't get stuck in uh, standardization of our uh, profession. Actually, in Europe, the, the big deal is that you uh, specialize in non standardization. So you don't do only hospitals, you don't do only residential, you don't do only commercial. So if you really want to confuse me, you ask me what you specialize in, because I never know what to ask. And um, really, what it is, is what you see here, right? This huge big system only works because there is the mega scale and there is the mini scale. This consists of a set of doorknobs, really, if you think about it. But it's also Manhattan and the place where we do a lot of our work. So, uh, I was going to jump back a little bit in history just to point out a few small things. This is the building we did around uh, 2000. Um, one of the first buildings we did where we really worked on the idea of the kind of smart skin thinking. What is a skin in your building? How can you rethink uh, a skin when it's no longer actually a physical protect protection like it used to be? You know, it's not a thick brick wall. Where you need protection. Really, what skin of a building right now is, is something which uh, optimizes the relationship of the public to the private. Uh, in this case, from, this, from the sky to the traffic below to the interior. Uh, but actual security systems come from electronic systems. So, what we did here, and this was a kind of uh, interesting in the sense it was our first kind of parametric project, uh, we were then still working in. Z and realized very quickly if you want to do a facade in uh, folded glass, and not just folded glass, but folded double glass, you need to figure out a way how to communicate this not to the contractor but to manufacturers. So what we did is we had the glass folded in Barcelona in Spain, we had the mullions extruded all in the same angles as the glass in uh, China, and the whole thing was systemized and put together in Brooklyn. Uh, we also separated the horizontal from the vertical volumes because that way we could weld the vertical volumes and actually float the whole system on the building as a set of horizontal bands with optical windows. This also is a classic solar energy uh, facade. It, it catches west light, uh, the heavy concrete floor behind it warm up. And so in winter, with low sun, it actually works as a heating system with high sun. There is a film in the glass that stops the radiation. Um, fun was that this building actually, you see, keep seeing this old building, it is actually an extension of an old warehouse, a six story warehouse that we uh, incorporated. So the six story warehouse was already there, we kept that, we made a scene to kind of negotiate both volumes, a brick volume and a glass volume. Um, but essentially, the six story warehouse got wrapped by a 12 story glass building, as you can see. Very, very important for us was to decode the building code. So where normally the building code allows you to go up to 85 feet and after that is a setback, we, in, we um, inflected both directions onto each other and that made it kind of a facade as one continuous way. Uh, 
Um, and then here you start to see how the structure is, everything moves in the same direction. And in this particular case, we also did the interior for um, an artist who uh, had a big collection of paintings and was kind of worried about them. So the, these walls you see here are actually walls that can close and then there is absolutely no view of where the paintings were. Uh, and uh, the whole interior was designed in Boko, which is actually kind of an oak that has been in the swamp for about 25 to 50 years. And that creates a natural long black pattern, so it's completely unpredictable what the pattern will be. Uh, but what's really nice is that it's actually um, kind of a natural uh, art thing that folded in the apartment and kind of separate the private and public functions. So then we moved. We were, we were thinking the, the it's kind of you could say it's a second and half dimension, right? So the normal second dimension is a plane, second and half dimension is a folded plane. And we became interested in thinking how this would work in three-dimensional space. So how do you go from smart screen to a smart space? Um, and we got to build a house in uh, upstate New York. I love this. So the racy uh, effect of the text is really not me, but kind of looks too. Um, so the Gypsy Trail house was a house upstate New York and was kind of um, set in the middle of the rocks on the big lake. But more importantly, we were really interested in seeing how we could take the functions of the house and all the hyperactive functions of the house, put them in the middle of the, uh, the space and kind of shrink wrap them in the most specific modulated space. Now, we were very, also very interested in how uh, industrial design is much more intelligent, malleable, uh, parametric, as we would say now, uh, than uh, architecture. So we were very interested in what you see above is the mold for a, um, a motorbike seat. And that mold just molds itself to your body. So we were thinking this, this particular unit in the house could be the one that actually starts to mold, mold itself to your body and starts to create something inside of the house which had basically bathing, cooling, heating, sound systems, kitchen uh, appliances, and all those kind of things, all in one space, which had two effects. One, you had a majorly modulated space in the middle of the house to which the roofs also modulated. But the second thing is that the spaces around it could kind of relax and just wrap themselves around it and had no further uh, intensification. So it was almost loft-like. So the rest of the house is really loft-like and wraps itself around this unit with inside and outside spaces. And here you see how the roofs uh, fall towards it. And also on top of that unit, we had skylights. So where normally that's the darkest of the house, it became the lightest of the house, and hence kind of almost like a reflector of light inside. So here you see again how the house was uh, located. We also had a small guest house, which you see in the back, sort of a wood backpack on the car garage. And then the, the way the skylight comes down with small um, uh, little gutters, and you see the inside or the guts of the house. Uh, from outside, which is also the shower, which kind of worried my clients a little bit because he kept saying, what about the soft season? Which is interesting for houses in the middle of nowhere. And then this is the bathroom. So you can see it's majorly modulated. It really kind of forms around you as well as around what is in the house. Um, and doors become almost like reflectors of light um, as well as, you know, when they close, close the light off. The other things like kitchen or a private places started to negotiate multiple places and spaces. So that um, where you see the fire <coughs> towards the kitchen and the dining. And here you look straight through the kitchen to the lake. So, that, so it's kind of a way of keeping this always open. Always important to us was that to, if we had here we have everything in bamboo, which is kind of a sustainable material. You can wrap always the bottom of it as well, so it feels like an object. It does not feel like an architecture which has applied surfaces. And the idea of the object, an object being completely detailed and thoroughly finished, is really important for us. Then what was quite interesting is we, uh, we got the question to do an exhibit in uh, a gallery, and we proposed to do a study on um, the kind of 
transformation from an object to an environment. And together with the MIT Media Lab, we had here the little sounds, that's a big room. Um, we made a, a floor that has sensitive fields, and any time someone stood on any of these fields, it would create another transformation of this object, which essentially is the inside of the house. For us, what that meant was that the house core, as it was modulated, it was an object, for sure, but much more important than its objectness was for us the fact that it unfolded and changed the environment around itself. So here, in a very abstract way, we were trying to, um, to, to show that in the exhibit, which was a huge holographic uh, exhibit in Frederick Taylor Gallery in New York uh, City in Chelsea. Absolute nightmare, because she promised these things, right? I was very excited about the idea, and said to her, this huge holographic thing, and then it took us nine months to figure out how to actually make a large holographic installation. So, it was, uh, it was really fun, though, and I've never seen that many people uh, in a gallery, even on, like, the most strange days, because it turns out people really love to play. So, it was kind of a busy, uh, busy gallery. Uh, very recently, we started working on something which is an interesting building. So where the Greenwich Building was really a set of 40 apartments uh, from ranging from uh, one bedroom all the way to this really expensive uh, penthouses with Cindy Sherman and the son of all kinds of poor people, uh, some actors, a uh, really, really fun building, but also like really, uh, you know, architects, us, us normal people. And I lived in there for a little bit. So um, this building is completely opposite. It's not for us normal people. It is terrible, to say the least. It's basically a set of uh, large villas, which is also an interesting urban type. So, you know, normally you think of houses that you have here, free standing on the side. The next density is maybe a row house. Uh, then the next density usually is immediately an apartment building. So this is kind of an in-between type. It really is a set of stacked units, uh, seven of them only, um, in a building that um, is in uh, Trebek in New York, which is a landmark district. Um, we thought here it was interesting to optimize to two things. One is the North Street facade and the other one is the South Garden facade. The North Street facade, we wanted to kind of work with a very flat, pixelated facade, which negotiated uh, the landmark buildings next door, and the back facade to modulate it as much as we could to kind of catch the sun, but at the same time also, when the sun is really high, to give a lot of natural shade. So what was quite interesting for us in a landmark district is because our site was really a parking lot, there wasn't a building to maintain, and Trebekah has a million different buildings, it's not really like you can say, okay, I'm going to make a traditional old building which as a European also region we get. So I tried to convince the landmark committee that we really believe in the quality of all buildings, the proportional systems, the floor heights, the generosity of space, the rhythm of the street facade, but not in copying of buildings. So we explained all that and they were okay, funny enough, I was quite surprised. Uh, they were okay with that and that was quite special, I think, for them. Uh, also, so what we did is the front facade, we really picked up the rhythm of the two the buildings next door, we made this pixelation and we made them in stone, translucent stone glass and translucent glass. Uh, the stone traditionally, the stone used in Trebekah and uh, the steel also traditionally in Trebekah. Here you see the building a little bit, the ground floor uh, is, has a garden but it's actually the roof of the Parking garage uh, below, so there's a car elevator that goes down. And then there's always that moment when you, you have these little diagrams on the bottom where you try to explain to your client or to the structure engineer how this building works, which is mostly a spider copy. <coughs> you have that short brief, mo brief moment when your building actually looks like a diagram and it comes out of the form of the copy and you know you're waiting for the, the framework to go up for the uh, curtain wall. And then this is a nice moment, the top, uh, top apartment at Top Villa has uh, an exterior stair that goes from the gym to the pool on the roof. And then of course prototyping. So I think what's really interesting, in architecture we move away 
from model making and representation of architecture into direct prototyping. And it's a big difference because it means that now with 3D printers we can actually prototype whatever we want to make in a much clearer um, version of what we're trying to get to. This of course is kind of a mock-up uh, where we where we in Italy um, made in Sardisir. Again a bit of a European exercise. The millions are from uh, titanium millions from Schuko, that's Germany. The stone came from Portugal, where originally also in uh, New York came from and uh, the whole thing was put together in Italy. And don't ask me why, it's still cheaper than making it in the US, which is kind of embarrassing, but true. And then the, this is the facade as we detailed it. And what was interesting about that is originally we had close to the uh, landmark preservation, very flat facade, which they thought was too horizontal. And they asked us to make it um, more vertical because they felt that traditional buildings were more vertical. So what we proposed is rather than make it too vertical to say, listen, let's make it democratic and pixelated 3D. So the horizontal and vertical are really even, and so you get a facade which does this when it comes in and out um, all the time, or inside where you start to see that it glows by day on the inside and by night on the outside. And then the bathroom would have inside the same, the same model as the outside so that it starts to fall in and out from uh, the facade. The penthouse is a duplex that has an exterior stair, a large background terrace, and is really kind of like an object that sits on the object, uh, with the spaces really connected in and out. And here you see the stair, so earlier, actually moving up to the roof and looking out of the trade center. And then here, so here you can kind of see how it almost feels like a normal uh, villa rather than a um, stacked building. But of course, in New York, you get amazing river views and, uh, and complex connections. Uh, big, large roof terraces. But what was also interesting for us is that by making very, very deep roof terraces, we started to work with very high, um, double height uh, facade levels. And also interesting, of course, is that as we are building now and our building industry is changing slowly, maybe too slowly, um, but we can customize more and more what we want to build. So the, the need for repetition, as we did in, this, in the 70s, is less and less. So it is possible to make completely customized apartments, as we did here. So you see here um, the top of one of the triplexes that has a double height space of the master bedroom and the living, whereas next door is actually double height between the living and the dining and the balcony for the, for the bedrooms up here. So the, 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 essentially every apartment is completely different in both the amount of balconies, the amount of square foot, the amount of floors they have, um, and it's more like a complete puzzle the way it fits into each other. Um, here you see the stairs. The stairs are all catalytic from the concrete walls, so they don't have to hit the floor, which is kind of nice. The last step flows. A lot of double height spaces. Close. And then this is quite nice, so I asked the doorman to show me uh, how to, so actually the wall goes into the <coughs> floor, as you see, that's really the car elevator. There was no way I could go up in the apartment, it would make sense. Um, and then the fence goes up, so that you actually, anytime you approach the building, <laughs> yeah, I know, he knows you, I know. It's like when he was also the super duper construction, it was amazing, but he still went to show um, but yeah, it's fun. It's fun to build urban buildings and to kind of play around with how, uh, while you have so little space, you can still add a lot of green, a lot of garden, a lot of parking, and all the kind of things. Um, this is our latest project. We just started on this. We have finished the construction drawings. It's one of my, my most beloved clients because he bought, actually called me and he said, I would like you to do uh, a house in Lima, Peru. Um, I'm already thinking, how do I meet this man? Uh, and it turned out he was in New York, came with his curator, because it wasn't just a house, it was also a, a space for his car collection or a museum. So, interestingly enough, it's not just uh, one function, so it's kind of a complete hybrid of a collection space and a residence 
uh, for him was really important because it was kind of his pet collection. Uh, but his pet collection was rather large, it was about 10 to 15 cars. Uh, and we decided to take the whole site as the, as the car museum, uh, to have a large ramp going down into it, um, have an undulating roof on top of the museum space, which then developed, and to make the house as a set of shifted volumes that allowed readers down uh, to, the, to the car collection, as well as, of course, through the house itself. Um, also important is that because of the climate, uh, we wanted to have a lot of house closed and shaded rather than completely open so that we have a bit of a, a balance between uh, what is visible, uh, the house is also a very, very small site as you saw, um, so the street is pretty close, it's an interesting uh, thing. So instead of just having the house with one skin, we made two skins, one with a uh, wall and windows and the large, uh, let's say, the large uh, openings, the shifted openings, but then wrap the whole house in a kind of a wood slab inside. And so, so here you see kind of all the aspects of the house, which are a car, a car space, void space, which cuts down in the car space, and then all the fragments of the house around it, which eventually turns out to be this house. It's quite a mysterious house. It, tra it transforms quite a bit if you move around it. Um, the skin itself has, a, has slats that, that basically fold open if they hit a window and then fold close again when they don't. So there's different transparency in the house as you can start to see here. On top, uh, the skin really fold open because it's a large room there on the top. And then the spaces get these partial views that are completely clear because of the openings between the volumes. And partially they're very shaded. So this is from the music room to the master bedroom, and then this is the master bedroom itself. So you see constantly these kind of very, very open uh, areas. And then quite nice on the roof, there's just the guest quarters and a private deck, um, which which kind of gives kind of a new garden because essentially having such a small garden also meant that if you want to build a house, you kind of need to replace the garden back on top in order to make it possible. And then, um, this is a small kind of movie where you start to move through the house and you start to understand a little bit how um, it functions. This is the main entrance, so the first floor is kind of a little bit up, with like you just look down into the car in here. And in this middle void is also where you find all the stairs, bridges, so that you constantly negotiate these voids and are able to move down, as well as have kind of very natural separation between different spaces and floors. So what is quite nice about, and then now we're moving down to the garage where we are basically um, going into the collection. Uh, the garden itself, as I said, is a quite topo topographical kind of differences and has these little cracks in the, in the garden itself to create natural lighting uh, and views to the, to the collection. But I think this one is the nicest way you really start to look up into the house. Um, and you see basically to uh, negotiate all And then this is the roof deck, of course, that um, is on top, which has the frame really closing down over you, um, and has also uh, sun shades and those, again, of course, because the heat is quite uh, intense and, again, deep down. So, it's a house that really talks to itself and constantly has uh, dialogues be between one space or the other. Um, especially since this person has a lot of guests, works in the house as well, and uh, moves between uh, a few different lives in a few different cities. Sorry to find it. Yes. And this is that that we saw before. And this is the villa as it goes. 
So we hope to uh, start construction on this very soon. Uh, the nice thing is the guide is also available. So I've never had as little questions as uh, with this particular client because I sent him a drawing and he goes, oh, I really like that. <laughs> so, do you have any questions? Do you want to know this? He says, no, no, I think the bathroom could be a little bit bigger. So it's very, very small uh, adjustments and it's, it's been a little bit better. Um, this is our, one of our smallest projects and I thought I should show it to you because I think as a student it's really interesting to see how you can do something tiny um, while thinking about architecture. So the question was, uh, one of our interns uh, in our architectural office uh, decided to become a fashion designer, became a very famous fashion designer called ZTP, and uh, had a fashion biennale in Holland and said, well, I should really do that with you. Um, and it would be interesting if he did it with us to work with his favorite uh, because we all work with patterns, right? Architects work with patterns, especially fashion people work with patterns. So I asked him for his favorite pattern uh, in order to topologically perform the pattern and see what we can make a uh, pavilion for the Yenala out of it. Um, so his favorite pattern was this pattern, which is uh, a pattern for a jacket. We took that pattern and essentially transformed it and started to think uh, about materials, what kind of materials could be used, and we quickly settled on a very interesting material which is a thick fabric impregnated concrete. And the moment you spray it with water, it essentially turns into the thinnest concrete shell that you have ever seen. Um, so this was the design. We smuggled a little bit with three sleeves instead of two sleeves. Um, and then we had to convince the uh, people of the of the fabric to give it to us. And this is quite an interesting fabric as it is actually a fabric used for a uh, small atomic buckers in the garden. This is a 60s material, very great for the atomic bomb. And so they were convinced that... Um, the core technology is a revolutionary new material called cloth, a cement impregnated fabric. So if you ever felt unsafe, you can just buy this little package where you just have this small concrete in your garden. We, of course, have a big mistake. We never had yellow metal thing on wheels, nor did we have the big inflation you see here. Step two is inflation. The shelter is inflated using an electric... And of course the market for this thing wasn't so far anymore, so they were very excited that they actually just to do something with their material and decided to give it to us basically for cost or uh, indicate shipping to the supermarket. But you see here how it's sprayed. It is quite amazing. It turns into a less than shell that's completely structural. The sexy bedroom story I didn't quite tell. But then you can grow your garden around it and you never notice that you didn't have one. <laughs> or you can burn it. Right. 60s was a really exciting period. <laughs> So our, sort of our story was slightly different. It was very heavy. It was extremely dusty. So our guys turned out to be uh, in these uh, toxic suits where you normally see them in, uh, in toxic disaster areas. Um, they found that also very handy to install this. Um, what we have designed was essentially a very, very uh, fragile suit system, more like rebar, made by a sculptor. We wrapped the fabric around it and we riveted it and it turned out to be this very strange uh, object in the fashion Vietnam. People had no idea what it was. They called it something between a cuddly elephant or uh, everyone was kind of stroking it, trying to figure out what it was. Uh, here you see one of the arms with the fashion on top of it. But it was very nice for us. It was this weird atmosphere. It was something between, it related somewhere vaguely to War, maybe still, it had this bunker feeling, but at the same time, it had this alien uh, effect. 
And it was very funny that because no one really knew what it was or, or, or how it was made, is that it turned out to be the, the favorite of everyone and actually won the award of, of the, the coolest pavilion. I don't think they say it was a beautiful pavilion, which was definitely not beautiful. But what is interesting about making something which is very logical in itself, although no one ever knows what logic that was or how it got to exist, is that it started to have such character that people couldn't resist liking it. And then, of course, what is quite beautiful because of the the very thick fabric, you get these incredible moments where it folds into each other and it, we had to rivet it, it folded around the, the plastic and um, yeah, that was, that was our pavilion and I think it's interesting to look at it because you think often, I, I remember they, they tried to make it smaller, they tried to make no arms, they tried to make whatever because everyone was like, this is too difficult. But once everyone got going, it's kind of interesting to see how everyone got super excited and really was happy to do it. In the same time, we were building a house for a fashion designer, uh, a large townhouse in Manhattan that I'm not going to show. Um, what was interesting for us is that while we were doing that, she decided that she liked working with uh, us and gave us all her stores, and that was London, Paris, and Shanghai. The largest flagship store is in Shanghai, and I think it's nice to kind of show you them a little bit because it's one of those things where we actually took the, the small research that we had done in the fashion biennale and we managed to make it in a large showroom. Um, of course, Shanghai, as you know, it is the, the site was right at the boat on the water. It is a city that has a huge article history and, of course, a huge shipping industry, history, um, especially in this very organic shape. The building itself was extremely heavy, as you see here. It was, uh, it's a very old building, and what we decided to do is to design a very light liner for it. So like your jacket would have a liner, we created a liner for the space, which is such a beautiful collection um, for the space. And um, we bought an old Chinese house that we recycled, had CNC in um, China into shapes, and although this looks very archaic, it actually contained all systems the space needed. So the slots here were for ventilation, it had sound systems built in, all the lighting built in, and all the plugins for the fashion building. So what is really nice is this archaic system, the, the recycling of the wood turned out for us to be the, the thing which was the most fluid. Uh, also, we love the texture of the wood and we ended up not sanding it at all, but just rubbing it with silver and oil. Then from there, the, the shapes kind of reflected further and uh, corresponded in the ceiling uh, treatments. Um, this is GRFC. It's actually a material we used to use in the 50s that is very easy to mold in uh, a workshop. can be uh, prefabbed, brought inside and completely made into fluid shapes and then turned out to be um, uh, the exhibit uh, elements in the middle of the space where the highlights of the fashion were visible. We had custom four tables made from uh, aluminum and finished from nickel. Uh, we designed these um, kind of bodies that were sculpted by a sculptor uh, rather than these, I hate those uh, dolls, you know, the ones in shops. So we decapitated them and made them like this. And then they were quite beautiful, so they're hanging in the space. And what's quite nice is if you walk around, they actually turn slowly around. So you get a very meditative kind of effect. Um, the, car the carpets were kind of the same shape. The lighting followed the architecture. So only where there was actually a point to show something, like here, where you have the tables, the light comes both from below and from above. Uh, and they're all CNC into the wood materials. Here again, the liner that shows the, uh, the collection as it is. And then also seats were molded into these elements so that um, essentially no furniture was needed. Everything was incorporated in this kind of smart object or the space becoming a smart object. And then moving into uh, last few projects that are very, very uh, urban, I would say. Um, 
as you know, architects, we get very uh, interesting questions. Like China, they uh, like to build whole cities at the same time. Other uh, cities like to add parts of cities or buildings. In this case, this was Abu Dhabi. And in Abu Dhabi, they uh, started a new uh, business district where the Sheikh wanted uh, two towers, an on star and a hotel tower. And we were really interested in how these natural formations created a dialogue between the parts without being similar. So for us, this was interesting, this kind of self-similarity in the way they move, but not self-similar in the way they express themselves. This is the area which is in the middle of Abu Dhabi. And this was kind of the first idea. What was also interesting is that the Sheikh was not interested in the towers of Dubai. Uh, which to him were objects like flames or ducks or whatever he, uh, he called it. He really wanted the tower to be something that would actually incorporate the city and pedestrians. And I think it's an interesting question because many of our towers are bastions of security. You could barely get into them. The lobbies are very neutral and essentially don't really allow a lot of negotiation. It's very different, for example, in Hong Kong because of the height difference that very often the first five floors of the tower are being up, which allows for shops and restaurants and all those things. Here in Abu Dhabi, he was interested in the same thing, so we started to think how the tower could spread out at the base and become something much bigger than itself, and underground would be connected into a large uh, shopping area. We also looked at the idea of having these public areas on the ground floor, not only being on the low levels, but traveling up into the building uh, where you would have public floors. So the, the skyscraper itself becomes more like a city with urban uh, fragments everywhere distributed throughout the tower. And these urban fragments were connected to small seas uh, in the culture. We worked with a, a German office to figure out how to use the skin as a, both a device that could stop the heating as well as uh, use the cooler sites to half cool the warmer sites, kind of make a natural ventilation between the skins. And here you start to see both towers, so they're not the same, but they do have a similar concept in the way they are derived. They have a very large spread out ground area, which is multiple layers towards the inside. And they're majorly fragmented so that also natural light could get very deep into the, the lower levels. You start to see more how it's actually layered. So there's, there's five layers before you actually get to the floor that has the security wood eventually need. But as you can see, also through these fragments, you can look up back to the tower. These sky lobbies became anomalies for us. So where the system of the trimming wall is quite a simple system and it has very smart glass. With the urban lobbies we completely created as another system interject interjected with that. So it has a larger, a larger steel frame. It has much higher floor levels, double height floor levels. This is the set of meeting rooms and, uh, and rentable uh, office spaces within the private uh, office tower. This is the gym, spa, and pool for the hotel tower that was also uh, available through membership. And this is inside of that same uh, crystalline shape or the anomaly looking back at the other tower. So it's a very, it's a very simple system but it creates something which is very personal and for each tower different. And then of course, what is interesting is that each tower has always the normal set of elevators that will uh, be very wide on the ground floor and slowly as you go up diminishes. In each top where normally a sky lobby would be, we interjected these large uh, intervening moments where there's public restaurants and public and things like that. And on the base you see the cuts, the large cuts so that light could really go into these uh, deep pores of the tower. This is the effect, but of course very beautiful is the light is really strong there. So by making it bounce of different folded surfaces, it really creates this very soft glowing effect. Then it goes really deeply, so it saves energy, but more than that, I think it's really important um, to kind of create this atmosphere, which is very much of there. So it feels almost like a mosque, or a, you know, what you see there very often is this beautiful indirect light. 
And I think it's important to kind of think what is the benefit of the specific conditions you find in an area, which are intrinsic to that area, and to see whether you can find that back in the architecture you create. And then here are the towers. And then, of course, the seams of the towers, they go into the parts of the park, so that at night you see the lighting of the parts of the park traveling up into the towers. So there's a sort of continuity between the ground plane and the, and the tower elevation itself. Then uh, we moved to China. I think we've all been in China. This is a really great province. It's the province where the main uh, city is Xi'an, <coughs> that probably everyone knows the best. It's Shansky. I, I pronounce it terribly, so my apologies. But that's the way, <laughs> that's the way I can pronounce it. Uh, but Shansky is the province of Xi'an, and Yulin is a northern city within that. Uh, that has grown really fast and was developing an area for um, their area that they want to integrate culture uh, with housing and offices. And it's an interesting question because, as we all know, a lot of cities segregate. There is a housing area, there is a shopping area, there is a cultural area. And I think that has been a huge, extreme uh, problem in China. And I think for the first time they're ready to kind of tackle that and to kind of look how in an area can you combine these things so that people can live, work, go to the theater, bring the kids to the kindergarten, all in one area. Um, the area was not very large, so we had to do an intensive study of how these uh, programs would slide by each other and how by uh, allowing green areas on roofs we could still have enough green and enough interesting moments to look down on the volumes. So these are some first studies to go from here to there. Um, the tower here in the back is actually where the hotel is located in the lower volume uh, that comes straight out into the shopping mall. The shopping mall wraps around the housing block where the shopping mall actually slips under the housing. This is uh, a large uh, theater and there is an office space. And sorry, this is the library, this is the theater, and this is not space. And then you see the, the things. The other thing is that in Yulin, it's extremely hot in summer and extremely cold in winter. It's almost Mongolian, but they have longer summers. So it's, it's an extreme climate, and it's not the moment to introduce glass curtains. So it was quite nice for us to think, how would how you make a, a tower, and what kind of openings could you create without having a glass curtain? So, especially, of course, the theater is a, is a really great volume that you can make almost without windows. Um, but also, the, the lower volumes still being all very glassy, and the higher volumes a lot closer. And then this is inside of the theater, where you have the lobby. That's really dark, you guys can see it. Not a lot of contrast in this. You can always look at it here. <laughs> I might have to send this to you. Uh, and then this is a housing that sits on top of the on top of the shopping mall that you can see here. So here you see the shopping mall itself has an ice wing. I don't know why, but the, the Chinese people really love ice wings in their shopping malls. And it's a nice kind of uh, I guess it's a nice interjection of saying hmm? someone say something. It's a nice inter interjection of uh, a whole family having a day out. So kids go skate, parents go shopping. Uh, it's, it's kind of a very interactive area. And for us, again, it was really important that that would have daylight and that you would also see that from above from the housing. And then we did a whole study of what kind of plants and what kind of vegetation would be good for that area, how it could be uh, groups. There is a, an office in New York City that is the former part of West 8 in Holland, um, and it's called MELK, which is the Dutch word for milk. Uh, MELK is a landscape architecture office we work with quite a bit. And they made a whole proposal for us on how to uh, not only have green on the ground floor, which you see here, but also on the roofs, and how to create certain patterns and 3D patterns to see whether these, uh, these green areas could really be interactive areas as well. And then we moved to Xi'an, the actual main city of the same uh, province, uh, which is a beautiful area with uh, 
Great St. Uh, this is the old city center. It's uh, maintained extremely well, if not a little Disney-like. Um, as you can see here, but it's, it's actually one of the few uh, Chinese cities where they understand the preservation and the, and the governor is very, very proud of, of his own city. Um, so here is Xi'an. Yulin was actually over here uh, in the top and we moved it down to the middle of the province. And then what I was very interested in, and this is not the happiest picture of it, especially since it's so dark, but what I was really interested in is the history of the Wutongs in China. And the Wutongs of China were um, ancient areas where people worked, lived, kids went to school, played on the streets, people bicycled. Uh, so it was very interactive and often also very green, which is not necessarily visible in this one, which is uh, in Beijing. Um, so when we made a proposal for this area, which was quite dense and had uh, both office towers and hotel towers in it, uh, we proposed to kind of work with this uh, premise, especially because in China there is very, very little actual attention for the ground floor. And we were really interested in seeing how we could create seven courtyards, green courtyards, and start to work with the ground floor as being super activated and the beginning from which everything would come out and also have partially green roofs on the tower itself. So you start to see these functions here. There's an extreme amount of retail, schools, uh, banks, uh, things people need on the ground floor. Um, well, and at the same time, these green groups travel up the towers um, in a major way, whereas here you see the ground floor. The, the inside of this area is completely public, um, so people are allowed to stroll in from the street and to activate it. And we thought it was really important. The, the, the whole thing, especially that area, and to be honest, that you see large fields of skyscrapers and essentially just plop down to the ground. Um, there is really no activation on the ground floor in a kind of more um, urban sense. So here we propose this and then also kind of making large openings to these areas so that uh, it would completely transform not only this block but hopefully the neighborhood. Um, and created the lower plaza here where you have a, a huge supermarket below ground that has its own plaza with uh, skyscrapers around it and a deeper area. Um, where you could activate uh, not only the shopping, the restaurant, people can go for lunch, uh, and the towers can look out over. Um, so this particular, actually the first one we want, this one is kind of postponed. I think uh, Xi'an is kind of thinking what he wants to do. And what happens a lot in China is when you do these proposals, they use it for fundraising to actually get the project going. So it takes a while to keep going. And then also in China is, um, as it grows so fast, you have moments like this, where this particular farmer decided not to sell. So the highway is kind of like an eight-lane highway, it's folded around this farm. This uh, was a duck farm. Very, very unhappy with the development. And I think he actually pulled out for a few years until he finally decided to sell and move on. So he's no longer there, don't worry. But he was there for a long time, and the stories were impressive, how they manipulated the family, they scared them, they threatened them, they did all kinds of things to these people. But this man was really holding out because he felt that people were untreated, were treated unfairly, and to just put a farmer into a skyscraper makes no sense. And he, he decided to make a point out of it and to have the world look at it. And I think it's an interesting uh, moment to think about it as we are all urbanizing and moving really fast sometimes. And of course, this kind of, the way cities evolve is very, very intense uh, on many levels. And when we started looking at Bogota um, for a client of ours, we decided that you can't just master plan anymore. Cities have become too complex to make a master plan. Essentially, what's really important is that we look from the bottom up. To look what is already there, how to extrapolate really important information and um, form that into new opportunities or new uh, moments that become generators of growth rather than a top-down plan. 
Um, so where this man was um, sitting in the middle of the highway, the people in Cairo had a complete other plan. And of course, I'm showing this because bottom-up initiatives have been there for, for centuries, which is different than what I'm talking about, but I think it's still important to show. These people live in an informal settlement outside of Cairo, and because they have no own ramp to the highway, they're not part of the larger economy of Cairo. So they decided to build their own on ramp and off ramp to the highway for rubble, sand, garbage, whatever. And because of that, become part of the larger economy. They also made a little house on the bottom of it and invited the police to come and survey it. So now this, this thing has changed its neighborhood so much that the city decided not only to allow it, but to uh, make the off ramp formal and to formalize the neighborhood. So this one initiative actually created a whole bunch of spin effects which totally changed this neighborhood. Another example of Cairo is this area where people have started to take uh, abandoned lots of land and create urban agriculture, um, becoming self-sustainable, starting farmers markets, and creating their own life in the city. I think also really important. So when we got this question for both times, it's a really interesting question. Uh, it's one of those questions that the client walks in and you think, wow, this is the moment that whatever I've done economically and whatever I've done in my practice really comes together. Because he literally asked me to make a bottom-up plan for Bogota. And Bogota, this is actually a photo of uh, Levitz Woods, uh, was of course an enormously fast-growing city already for a long time. It um, has a large amount of informal settlements, but more importantly, urbanization in Latin America is currently around 75 percent, and Bogota is one of the fastest growing uh, cities. And not only does it have the informal settlements, but as you see at the top, it has a gigantic growing middle class. This is the first time in history that Latin America has as many people in the middle class as in the poorest class. It never happened before in history, and I think it change more. So what happened there? There is now a new client, you could say. This middle class needs schools, they need facilities, they need housing, they need all kinds of things. And what is quite interesting is that this middle class also no longer needs the Western world to take care of them. They can take care of themselves. And what my client found when they uh, developed a large tower in downtown Bogota, where they had crowdfunding, so the, the people actually funded it. Um, they raised from over 2,500 particular small investors double the amount they needed for the tower. They didn't expect that at all. They had no idea why that happened. And when they started to look at that, what was becoming very, very clear is that these people had nothing to invest in. The banks and the, and the currency were totally untrustworthy. They wanted something, they wanted to invest in something they could see, feel, and stood on the ground, literally. And of course, they wanted to invest in their future and their city. So what can you do? So this new middle class wants to grow. It doesn't need our help anymore. And this crowdfunding thing is actually now reality. So how do we start to work with these people? My client had a very interesting idea. He uh, asked the uh, radio, W radio, that, that uh, mostly transmits in the morning between 6 and 9, that is when people are sitting in their cars going to work, um, to ask them to look at a website, which is essentially, you know, this was part of that website, um, to come and talk to us about what they thought their city should do. So we put together, there's an interesting uh, kind of trans uh, research office in New York, it's originally English, it's called PSFK, uh, together with PSFK, my client, we put together, I think, 3,500 questions for people, ranging from what they wanted in parks, what they wanted, you know, how they wanted to change certain things, and what they thought was important. And from that, um, we started to derive trends and see what we could do. What was really interesting is one day, I remember looking at it, like maybe a month into it, and we had maybe 8,000 followers. The next time I looked, which is two weeks later, we had 200,000 followers. So it was completely crazy. And what was really interesting is that because we were only thinking about downtown, and downtown is a huge region, believe me. 
as the region on the left. But in Bogota, it's a small dot. And so this city is really interesting in the sense that all the rich people move to the north, and the southern areas is where people come from the from rural areas and move into these form, uh, informal settlements. So it's a very, very big difference. And you know, the city has tried to change it. So for example, this used to be on the right side, the inside of the city, and they uh, moved everyone out and made a beautiful park. But of course these people didn't leave. So what happened is now next to the park you have something called the Bronx. And the Bronx is where all the people who used to live in the park are now living next to the park. And it's quite a dangerous area. I tried to walk my students through it and actually one of those people came up to us and said, what are you trying to do? Kill yourself? <laughs> so I asked them to pull at you. But yeah, this is the, the kind of uh, the, the, the region. Um, we realized a few really interesting things. One was um, the downtown area only has around 275,000 people living into it, but 1.7 million people move <laughs> in and out every day, which is totally ridiculous. And they have, they have an amazing bus system, which works relatively well, but the problem is that the roads go from eight lanes to one lane, because the whole downtown is really tiny. So we realized, thinking about this bottom-up system, one thing, uh, we thought was really important is to take five really important things we had found uh, through this research with the people, but also by looking at the statistics ourselves. Is that if you would do smart acupunctures, that each one of these acupunctures could have like five spin off effects. So this was one of them. We decided that if you change this area and you actually got people to live there, then not only would it get less dangerous because you have more social control. You would also have less pollution because less people would be in their cars. And you would be able to say if with 33 universities in downtown alone, you could move a million students to downtown in micro-housing. It would be really interesting to see what would happen because these students would need utilities, they would need all kinds of other things. And then you could foresee that this would grow really fast, growing the very flat area to the to the northern region, which is high. The second scenario we had was, and it's a very interesting one because just after we proposed this, um, California proposed exactly the same for the LA River. So it's not that a lot of these problems are not exactly only for these one areas. Um, Bogota is very much a, an area that has. Um, uh, well, it's essentially wetland. It lives on, it sits right on the edge of a high mountain range, and the wetlands are um, responsible for taking all the rain and all the water that comes up of the mountains. Now, from the five rivers, uh, they have basically turned every river into something like that on the left, which is either completely close to the concrete pipe or it is the concrete basin. And the problem is, of course, that now the earth next to it is completely dry and you get a huge flooding. This was the original wetland, and what the problem was is that the wetlands were diminished to about 3%, so you can see here, and this is the direct consequence. So it's also because of that that the rivers are extremely polluted, um, people drown like regularly. It is, it is actually, this is not even once a year, this is a few times a year that this happens. So what you could say is, if in this area you have this river, so that the river is actually a little greener. So this is actually the river here. Um, if you could take that river and you could start to bring back a natural uh, green area to this area, you would solve a few things at the same time. Not only is this area mostly where the legal settlements are, so we would create better housing for these people, but in the same time, we would give these people um, urban agricultural lands so that they start to have an area where they have not only wetlands, but they have recreation, they can grow vegetables, and they potentially could start farmers markets and make local communities self sustainable. Um, a lot of the medicine in Colombia comes actually from herbs still, as it was traditionally. So the other option is, of course, to grow the herbs and to uh, create the medicine. 
uh, farmers markets, as I said, and of course, eventually, it would be really great if they could buy the Olympics and start to grow the city from the inside out. <laughs> what we realized is that this wasn't only maybe a strategy for um, Colombia or Bogota, but this is actually a really interesting strategy to look at cities in general, and especially in Latin America, but also in other areas. And um, interesting was that when we were doing this, we were asked by an Avis Gallery in Berlin, it's one of the largest architecture galleries in Europe, to um, do an exhibit together with Tora uh, which is another kind of warm-up informal community, uh, to do a proposal. And we decided that since, since this proposal is really non-linear, it's about chunking or it's about creating moments and seeing what spin-off uh, uh, effects would be, that it was really important to show this exhibit really as chunks and as parts of information that would then create other information. But even more important was to take the reactions from the website, uh, from the people, uh, and frame the exhibit with it so that it really became the opinion of the people of Bogota creating what was in the middle of the exhibit, uh, which then started to show these five scenarios as we had developed them. Uh, in a huge symposium in Berlin, we had a discussion about what is what is the effect of things like this on the city and how would you uh, react to it. And one of the interesting things was what I didn't expect at all. Uh, that, uh, the, the general opinion of people in Berlin was like they wanted their city to grow like that. And what is the reason why I think is if you top down the city, it's formally and conceptually maybe strong. But if you allow a city grow from specific points, it grows economically, culturally, and socially. And I think that's the only holistic way, really, for our future cities to grow. So I think that was also what they saw in Berlin and why they were really interested in, in discussing this. So that's, that's a, small, uh, a small conclusion. Um, but yeah, I think architecture is, at this point, in a really, really interesting phase. And I think for us architects, it's really uh, the moment where we can start to see ourselves maybe as consultants or as people who are able to tackle the bigger problems that are going on and to become part of teams to start to think of how to resolve these issues. Because, you know, yes, we can still do great buildings, we can still do great buildings and maybe make great cities, but I think also really important is to see what are the, the points where it's not running so well and how can we as, as architects work together with other experts and see how we can get everything back on track. Because I think with the amount of stuff that is not going well right now, when you step out of, out of the safety of your own environment, uh, it's really important that we all start paying attention to other darker things see what we can all have in our own small individual way. Um, but we as architects, we're the ones who can create uh, complex systems, work together in big networks, and actually derive very precise information out of a lot of complex issues. And I think for, uh, for that, for me, it's really interesting. And I think for us in universities also, it's really interesting to start to focus on that more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Because 
you know, when beginning of the 90s, right? And this is, I'm a product of that because I studied in Colombia in 1992. When we were making blogs, I was always thinking, well, a blog is just like a box to wrap, right? There's no complexity to it. What, what is up with this? And I saw I never really got into the blog thing. And I was like, kind of the Dutch weird person on the edge. But I was really interested in what maybe, uh, I was really interested in the sort of issues, you know? Like, how can I look at architecture, how maybe a car designer would look at a car? Which incorporates the road, it incorporates speed, it incorporates the inhabitants in the car, it incorporates technology. It's, it's a multi-layered question. And, and, you know, then having said that, we still incorporate cities and all that stuff. So, I was very interested in the more intelligent aspect of the computer, how you could start to test it. So I would put information in the computer, especially in the beginning, very often in animation, kind of run these things, but not use them as a formal tool, but to really derive information out of it and to see how I can start to play with things. Um, so we could talk about the house was one of the consequences of that. Um, and then I realized as I was starting to build these things that the, what I said is that the object was really not that important, but it had a huge effect on the environment just around it. So for example, if I was in a space next to the object, the object was actually this kind of, you know, what they said um, of the exhibit, it had a, an effect that was almost like having a big pebble in the space. So it had this natural logic. And I, I really like that effect. And I think it is because, you know, the problem I have is I, I studied sculpture for architecture, so I can't think flat, which you might have noticed. So for me, everything is 3D from the beginning. That's why I always work with the computer. I, in 1990, I graduated in Holland with computer drawings. We got the first person and animations, wider, little wider animations. Um, but that was just because I couldn't really think flat. And the benefit of that is, I think, that I started to realize, you know, a box is not logic as much as a blob is. What is really logic is to figure out like, what is the relationship of the body to the space around us and the space to itself. So the, how can you start to build these relationships? So for me, all the projects I build are kind of from the inside out. I start with something small and then the whole thing kind of evolves, let's say. So even in a, in a project like a building, I actually let it grow also more than top-down planet. And then, you know, that's why you get the house with the cracks and all those kind of things. Um, but what is, what is interesting about it, like, for me, is that the fracturing, as I said in the beginning, is really kind of an optimization, optimization. But, you know, also, you know, I don't know when you guys talk about this triple O thing here, but interesting about that is that it's Edmund Husserl. In my second book, I wrote a whole thing about Edmund Husserl, who I think is, if you haven't read the little book called The Original Geometry of 1937, you have to read it. It's, for two reasons, really interesting. One is the introduction by Derrida is longer than the text by Edmund Husserl. Um, and obviously, that makes that text super interesting because if you make an introduction longer than the text, that obviously has something. But also, he talks about things like uh, foronomic shapes. And foronomic shapes for him were uh, shapes made, he literally says, through gradual perfection. So not like I don't think it's not, it's gradual perfection. And these things in themselves become generative of something else. And I mean, I read this after I did the house, and I thought, oh my god, this is amazing. In 1937, someone described my house, so this is the weirdest thing ever. And he calls it also meaning form. So it's not a form just for the form itself, it's form because it is derived from meaning. And I think that, to me, describes a ton of stuff. You know, and it's really interesting to me. This, I mean, he's described as kind of a phenomenologist, but what is interesting now, it comes back in triple O, which is object ontology. So it's weird how now it's presented as kind of the future, whereas I wrote about that in 1996, I think. Just, no, no, 1996, 2006. So 10 years ago, which is really interesting. And I, just because I totally by accident found this text, this little book, and uh, and skip 
Derrida. We read, read him first and then went back to Derrida and went down. And I thought, oh my God, this, this is hands down the best thing I've read about architecture. And I, I have to say, I do love mathematics. You know, I think the fact that mathematicians in 1850 figured out things like the Hedgesville, Greenland surfaces, flying bottle, whatever, and two centuries later, still like, like it's you. You know, we look slow. And, and so it's, it's really important, I think, to, to at least think that, you know, to understand that all these things were figured out in 1850, and what do we want to do with that in architecture, you know? Do we want to ignore it? Do we want to be there? I don't think mathematics is really close to architecture. You know, maybe not as close as abstract geometry, but it's still a, a really important aspect. So I've always been very inspired by those kind of things, you know, the mathematics and philosophy. I can read a philosophy text and design buildings. It's terrible. I can never do it the other buildings and design buildings, and I feel like, what? So that's maybe what you've noticed.